If you abide, remain in my word, you are truly my disciples, and you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. We thank you, our Father in heaven, that you have not left us in the darkness, that in the Lord Jesus Christ you have given us life, that through his living word you give us life to begin with now, and you will give us eternal life in your new creation. Please enable us now to listen to these words. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. I hesitate to say this, but do you recognize these words? Jerry, Jerry, Jerry. If you're like me and you occasionally watch daytime television, Back in the 90s, you'll recognize that's a show, terrible show really, called The Jerry Springer Show. And again, I hesitate to bring it up, but from time to time, or pretty often actually in that show, you'd have a situation where there was a lady who was brought forward, and she claimed that a certain man was the father of her son. The man denied it. There would be a great big debate, in fact, probably a fight on the stage, and then there would be the great big reveal, and it would be discovered who the father actually was was pretty shocking scene in this TV show, pretty terrible TV, pretty sad as well, in fact, and uh, one that is uh, really quite awful. But what we have here in this passage is a paternity test reveal, and one, dare I say it, which is even more shocking than one might find on the Jerry Springer show. If you've been with us, you'll know from chapters 5 onwards, we've been seeing this heightening opposition to the Lord Jesus Christ, surprisingly from the elite, the establishment, the Jewish leaders. It doesn't seem very surprising to us because we know whenever the Pharisees turn up on the scene in a play, we're to boo and hiss. We've been accustomed to that. But it was shocking for the first readers and the early Christians because this was the establishment, the leaders of Israel the moral and intellectual elite, the very people who should have embraced the Messiah if, in fact, Jesus was the Messiah. And here's the big question for early believers in Jesus and those who were looking in, whether Jewish or Gentile. Why is it that if Jesus really is the Christ, the most intelligent, the most impressive, the most able, the dominant culture leaders of our society, why do they say no to Jesus. Perhaps I've got it wrong. And why? Well, if I do believe, will there be such pressure on me to give up? That's the pastoral situation for those first readers, and you can immediately see how relevant it is for us. Jesus is continuing to teach. It's the last day of the Feast of Booths, or the Feast of Tents, literally. We saw that back in chapter 7, verse 37. And Jesus continues now in the very heart of the leadership of Israel in the temple in Jerusalem. And he's surrounded by Jewish leaders who are attacking him. You can imagine them pointing figures in accusation as he answers them back. And at every moment, Jesus exposes the reality of their situation, what is really lying under all of their impressive clothes and their credentials and PhDs from the rabbinical schools. Why is Jewish leadership so opposed to Jesus? It's not an intellectual difficulty. It is so obvious by the signs Jesus has done that he is the Lord himself. It's not the difficulty of his teaching. It is plain. Any child could understand what he is saying, that he brings life, eternal life, in a world of death. But because, and here is the shocking paternity reveal, of this passage, verse 44. Jesus says, because you are of your father, the devil. All the opposition to Jesus ultimately comes down to this. Then, and shockingly, even today, because of whose father, those who oppose the Lord Jesus, is people who ultimately, all of us by nature, ultimately belong to the father of lies. What Jesus is doing in this passage is bringing us back into the great cosmic reality that was there all the way back 
in Genesis chapters 1 to 3. He wants us to see reality as it actually is, not as it is on the surface. That there is a cosmic battle between God the Lord and between the enemy. Between the Lord who rules by his word and creates and gives life by his word and the enemy who is the father of lies whose aim is to bring death and suffering. And the aim of John and God's aim for us this morning is, like he is in every passage, that we would believe the truth because it is the truth and the truth alone that will set us free, that will give us life despite the opposition from the cultural and dominant elite in the society around us. It's a large passage. We won't be able to go through every verse. I just want to pull out three main ideas. And the first one is simple. It is that Jesus is the Lord, the Lord who gives life. Jesus is the Lord. He is Yahweh, the I Am, the God of the Exodus, the God of Genesis, who gives life. As we said, the setting is the Feast of Tents, and it reminds Israel of their time in the wilderness. In fact, Jewish people do it today. You'll find them putting up tents in this festival time, remembering that they were traveling through the wilderness from Egypt under slavery and death into the promised land of liberty and life. And Jesus is that Lord who led Israel through the wilderness. That has been the point time and time again when he's been speaking about his identity. And here very clearly as well, I am, he says time and again, that same Lord who has come from the Father before the beginning of all the ages into this world in flesh, the one who rescues his people from slavery into liberation. The I am of the Exodus, the I am of Isaiah chapter 43 verse 11, I, I am the Lord and besides me there is no saviour who rescued his people out of slavery in Babylon into the promised land, but has come to bring the ultimate rescue out of this world and onto the journey into eternal life. You can see that point there time and again in these verses. At the beginning of the passage in verse 12, I am, says Jesus, the light of the world. And again, all the way at the end of the passage as well, in verse 58, truly, truly, I say to you, before Abraham was, I am the Lord. We can't miss it. Again, in verse 24, Jesus says, I told you that you would die in your sins, for unless you believe that I am he, I'm the Lord, you'll die in your sins. And again, in verse 28, then you will know that I am Jesus is the Lord, that's the point, the same God of the Exodus, the one who has come to bring everything that the Lord did for his people then, he brings for the world ultimately now. Three little things that we can notice. First, he has come to bring light in our darkness. Again, verse 12, Jesus says, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will not walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. Whenever we see a concept in the Bible, we shouldn't do as we sometimes do and just jump into our present day understanding. We think of light and therefore there's darkness and you turn a light on. And that. No, actually the context is always from the Old Testament. What does light mean in the Old Testament? In the Exodus context, well of course, as Israel is being led out in the darkness across the Red Sea, the great pillar of fire, the light burnishing bright across the skyscape was the Lord himself. A pillar of fire at night and a cloud by day. He was the light who led his people out of darkness and into the light of life. That is what God is saying. Darkness is ignorance. And the leaders in verse 13 onwards accuse Jesus of failing to keep the law. Jesus replies that he himself does keep the law. There are witnesses as the law prescribes himself and his father. But the point is Jesus demonstrates that they are in the darkness. Verse 19, you neither know me 
nor my father. If you knew me, you would know my father also. The Jews, as we've been seeing throughout this passage, are in the darkness. And indeed, that is true of our world. Ever since the fall of man, this world under the cover of darkness and ignorance. You go down to Bondi Beach, people enjoying themselves, backpackers from Ireland and Aussies from Bondi, I suppose, on the beach enjoying themselves in the bright sunshine, but spiritually, darkness. You go to the classroom at the university and the lecturer from the front, seemingly very, very wise indeed, but actually a lecture hall of complete darkness. You go to Allianz Stadium and you watch the state of origin and you cheer on Queensland as you should. Darkness, complete darkness. But Jesus, the Lord himself, is the light, the pillar of light, leading people who will follow him so that they will not walk in the darkness but walk in the light of life. And in this room, there are spots of light because the Lord has given us his light in our hearts if we believe in him. And our lives are a journey of following that light in this darkness from death into eternal life. Jesus is the Lord who brings light, but he is also the Lord who brings life. Did you see that in verse 12? You could have missed it. I am the light of the light of life. Light who brings life. It's a connected idea. Time and again in John's gospel, in him was life. Verse 4 of chapter 1. But they are in the grip of death, the leaders of Israel. We see that in the next subsection from verse 21 to 30. Verse 21, Jesus says, you will die in your sin. They wonder if he's going to kill himself, but again, they demonstrate their darkness, their ignorance. Verse 24, he says again, I told you you would die in your sins, for unless you believe that I am he, you will die in your sins. Israel was alive, so to speak, in Egypt, but in fact, spiritually speaking, they were dead, under death in Egypt. And actually, they were a picture of what is true of our whole world ever since the fall, and we've said it time and again, physically alive, but spiritually and ultimately dead, disconnected from the life of God, all heading to the conveyor belt of the grave, every one of us. But amidst that darkness, the Lord has come to bring life. Amidst that death, now with the Lord Jesus, life is springing up all over the place. A friend of mine has just been to Dubai. They told me it is absolutely spectacular. But of course, a few generations ago, not that long before they found oil, Dubai was a desert. No life. But then all of a sudden the water came and the money to pay for the irrigation and so on and so forth. And there is life in the midst of death. That is what we have in the Lord Jesus Christ. But of course, in a much more profound way. Life from outside this world. Verse 23, you are from below, I am from above. You are of this world, I am not of this world. Do you remember Jesus speaking to Nicodemus? You must be born again. You must be born from above, literally. Life that is there in the realm of God, entering into a world of death and giving life. Again, shoots of life all around this room for those who put their trust in Jesus and have his life invade their dead bodies and give their souls eternal life. To give your souls eternal life. That is what we have. Jesus, the Lord, the God of the Exodus, who brings light who brings life, and finally, who brings liberation. Light, life, and liberation. Did you see that theme in verse 31? So Jesus said to the Jews who had believed him, if you abide, that is, remain in my word, you are truly my disciples, and you will know the truth, and the truth will liberate you, set you free. They answered him, we're offspring of Abraham. We've never been enslaved to anyone. How can you say that you will become 
free. These rabbis obviously failed year five Jewish history. Of course, they were slaves in Egypt, slaves in Babylon, (laughs) slaves now under Rome. But more profoundly, they were slaves to sin, sin which leads to death. Verse 34, Jesus answered them, Truly, truly, I say to you, everyone who practices sin is a slave to sin. Despite their law, despite their religious practices, despite their learning and their culture, as we've been seeing in Romans, for those who've been studying it, underneath, sin. And what was true of the very best, as it were, of humanity, God's chosen people, the ones who might have had the very best chance to generate a righteousness of their own, well, true of every one of us by nature. By nature, those who are slaves of sin, who sin and cannot stop sinning, no matter how hard we try, enslaved to sin, which ultimately leads to the death penalty. But how will anyone ever escape? Well, again, it is the Lord, the Lord who rescues his people. Verse 35, the slave does not remain in the house forever. The son remains forever. So if the son sets you free, you'll be free indeed. Who alone has the right to set someone free in a household? It is the father and the son of the father. And that is what he's done. He's come down into our world and opened the gate, as it were, of the dungeon and swung open the door and leads us out into the freedom of relationship with our creator. They were enslaved to sin despite their outward moral appearance. And all of us are by nature. But the Lord is the one who gives life, who gives light and who gives liberation, true liberation, And how does he do it? Well, he does it by being lifted up. Verse 28. When you have lifted up the Son of Man, then you will know that I am he, that I am the Lord. The cross, the moment of his lifting up, which is a great irony. Those who know Isaiah will remember it was the Lord who was high and lifted up in his chamber. Isaiah profoundly overwhelmed by the presence of the Lord, as everyone is, whoever comes face to face with him. But this is the mystery, the extraordinary mystery, that as the Lord comes into the world in Jesus Christ, he is lifted up not in glory, but on a cross. And as he's lifted up, he's seen to be the Lord himself, the Lord himself on the cross, paying for our sins so that we can be freed from slavery and brought into eternal life. How wonderful that is. If you're a Christian here this morning who believes in Jesus Christ, you have all of those privileges because of him. Life, eternal life. Light in the darkness of this ignorant world. Liberation from the slavery to the consequences of sin and the beginning of being able to say no to sin. And all because he has been lifted up. Jesus is the Lord who brings life. But in contrast, and at the same time, woven throughout this passage is something else. And it is the opponents, as we said at the beginning, the opponents of Jesus who are the children of the devil who brings death. The opposition to Jesus who are the children of the devil who bring death. And we need to know this just as they did. Verse 38 I speak of what I've seen with my father, and you do what you've heard from your father. What does Jesus mean? Well, verse 38, they answered, hey, 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 hang on. Abraham is our father. Abraham, the father of the Jewish nation, as we had read in Genesis 15. But Jesus says, no, I'm afraid you're not. Yeah, sure, by bloodline you are, but that doesn't actually make you his children. Verse 39, Jesus said to them, if you were Abraham's children, you would be doing the works Abraham did. Abraham, the man of faith, who trusted the Lord. But you don't trust me, the Lord, who is standing 
before you. Instead, verse 40, you seek to kill me, a man who has told you the truth that I heard from God. This is not what Abraham did. And what's the reason? Verse 41, you are doing the works your father did. Jesus says, if God was your father, you would love me. I came from God and I am here. But they will not listen. Verse 43, why do you not understand what I say? It is because you cannot bear to hear my word. Not because they can't, but because they won't. And here is the great paternity test reveal that we began with. Verse 44, you are of your father, the devil, and your will is to do your father's desires. He was a murderer from the beginning and does not stand in the truth because there is no truth in him. When he lies, he speaks out of his own character, for he is a liar and the father of lies. But because I tell you the truth, you do not believe me. And here is the shocking verdict of the Lord Jesus. After all these chapters of opposition, he pulls back the screen, as it were, and says, this is the real reason. Because you are children of the devil. How difficult for the the early readers to see because they looked so impressive outwardly. But here we have this cosmic battle that began all the way back in the garden between Satan and his lies and between God and his truth. And outwardly, they are so impressive, so intimidating, bullying, the little people, intellectual. You can't believe that, can you? Bullying the people by intimidation. You'll know what will happen, of course, if you keep on trusting in Jesus. And yet Jesus is the I am. He is the Lord of light and life and liberation, which brings us to what this means for us. What is the right response to the fact that Jesus is the Lord of of life, to f- the fact that the opposition back then and now that want to silence Jesus are the children of the devil who brings death. The right response is there in verse 31, a famous verse. So Jesus said to the Jews who had believed him, if you abide, that is, if you remain in my word, you are truly my disciples. And again, verse 51, truly, truly, I say to you, if anyone keeps my word, he will never see death. It's the same theme over and over again. It is the word. It is the truth. It is Jesus' voice. And it should be no surprise to us because that is how the Lord brought creation into existence, by his word. It's who Jesus is, the word of life. Life in the garden was ruled by the word of God, had Adam obeyed it. And verse 32, it is the truth that will set you free, liberate you from death and slavery for eternal life. And verse 44, they are those on the side of the lies of the devil. The devil brought death back then in the garden through his lies. Surely you will not die. And today he is lying in all sorts of ways to bring suffering and death to the people of this world. And the only answer, the only escape is those who will trust in the truth that sets free. But did you notice it is not just enough to believe Now, you may be shocked by that because we've heard, if anyone believes in me, you will have eternal life. But interestingly, look with me to verse 30. As he was saying these things, many believed in him. But those who believed are the same people who at the end of this passage pick up stones to throw at Jesus. And what I think is being said in this passage is that those who are truly my disciples, verse 31 are those who not only believe my words initially, but those who actually abide or keep my word 
for the whole of life. If you abide, if you hang on to, if you remain in, if you stick with my word, despite the great opposition all around you from family and friends and society and culture and our own temptations, well, then you will be set free and have eternal life. That is the message for us this morning. Verse 31 and verse 32. If you abide in my word, you are truly my disciples and you will know the truth and the truth will set you free. It's as we remain in Jesus' word, not just at the beginning, but as we go on day by day in the journey of this life, that we will have the light that we need, that we have the life that we need, that we will have the liberation that we so desperately need. And the truth, Jesus himself, the way, the truth, and the life will set us free. Of course, in one sense, he profoundly has already done it. Eternal life in our hearts, light in the darkness, life in the desert. But at the same time, bringing us to the full experience of that, knowing him in the eternal kingdom that he is bringing. And so, brothers and sisters, this morning, it's a simple message that we'll know from the Sunday school, but one which is utterly profound and one that we must deeply believe. If you remain in my word, you are truly my disciples, and you will know the truth, you'll know Jesus, and the truth will set you free. We pray together. We thank you, our Father, that you do not leave us in the darkness, that the words that we read and hear are the same words that brought life into existence. We thank you that in this world of lies, under the grip of the evil one, you have given us your truth in the Lord Jesus Christ. And we pray that you would enable us, despite the opposition, to abide, to remain in his word and thus prove to be truly his disciples and enter into your eternal kingdom. And we ask it for Jesus' sake. Amen.